Okay, everyone. Uh, so, welcome to Anomaly Detection Algorithms and Techniques for Real World Systems. Uh, so, my name is Manoj Anandi. I am the lead uh, data scientist at StealthBits Technologies. And so, this talk is sort of based on like some of the work I've done at StealthBits over the like uh, past year and a half. So, a quick outline for this talk is a quick overview of like anomaly detection. What makes this different from other like data science and machine learning type problems? And then I'm going to talk about detecting anomalies in three different settings. In data streaming settings, we have data coming in and you need to do anomaly detection in real time. Uh, Density-based anomaly detection, so this is when you have a bunch of data points and you want to figure out which one and others. And then finally, anomaly detection in time series. So if you have user activity over time, how do you find anomalous uh, speaks and uh, spikes? And then finally, at the end, I'm going to talk a bit about like two practical things about how do you do this in the real world with regards to testing and how do you convey these, uh, this information to end users. So what are anomalies? The million dollar question. And the thing is, like, we all have some conceptual idea about what an anomaly is, but it's really hard to define. It's some of those, like, you know it when you see it with things. But if I were asking you to find an anomaly, you'd probably give me something along the lines of, it's just something that's noticeably different from what is expected or is different from everything else. And that's the kind of description, but it allows us to like sort of flexibly define anomalies. Like anomalies are not this like hostile, like hard, steadfast thing that's going to stay fixed over time. Anomalies are going to change over time. And one thing that's important to consider is what is considered anomalous now may not be considered anomalous in the future. You know, a, a couple of weeks ago, kids running around the park at 3 a.m. would be considered now there's this thing called Pokemon Go, and kids hanging around parks at 3 a.m. is completely normal. So there are very different approaches to anomaly detection. So one thing we can do is sort of develop a statistical be uh, model of like normal behavior. And then we can sort of test as each observation comes in, like how well does it fit into this model? And so we can say, if the day people show up according to this model, and then we observe them and say, oh, according to this model, you're acting anomalous. The way, then this is one way we can do this. Another way is we can sort of take a more machine learning approach and try to use classifiers to label data points as like a normal anomalous. So there's one big issue with this approach of cheating as a machine learning classification problem is that there's a huge class like that. More than 99% of your data should be normal and less than 1% or less than 0.1% of your data should be anomalous. That huge class imbalance is going to be uh, causing you big problems. You can't do deep learning on this because you don't have enough anomalous examples and other traditional machine learning algorithms like support vector machines and random forests are also having uh, issues will also have issues just because of the class imbalance. So for this talk, algorithms that are specifically designed to deal with anomalies and deal with outliers that are very rare in your data set. And so the first setting we're going to talk about is anomalies in data streams. And so in this setting, we basically have data coming in continuously. And we need to be able to identify anomalies in real time or near real time. So as soon as they come three, five seconds at most, we'd be able to say, this is normal or this is anomalous. And so then we have a huge constraint because when we have data streaming, you really can't keep track of everything. You can only keep track of maybe like the last 100 events that happened. And so you need to be able to come up with these like sort of quick and dirty methods that can act quickly, that can like quickly label, uh, identify things as anomalous or not, but also work with the fact that we have limited memory. So let's start with something that's should be familiar to people if you've taken a statistics course. The z-score. So the z-score is something that's sort of used to determine like how extreme an observation is. If you know the population mean and you know the population standard deviation, you can calculate a z-score and it sort of measures like how extreme that value is, how likely is it to be. And so the general idea of the z-score is that you have the mean which just tells you like what the center is, what you should see the data centered around, a standard deviation, which tells you like how far, sort of like a measure of spread, like how far away can we go from the center before we say, oh, hey, something's wrong with this. And one way you can use that is to do moving averages and moving uh, standard deviations. So as the data comes in, 
you have an average of like the last 100 data examples and the standard deviation of the last 100. As a new point comes in, you update the average, you update the standard deviation, and then you can calculate a z-score for this new point. Now, if this z-score ex exceeds some threshold, let's say 3.5 or 3, uh, then you can flag that point as anomalous. But there is actually a big problem with this. And it's not so much in like how we use the, more the fact that like averages and standard deviation are actually kind of bad when it comes to extreme values. So it turns out um, standard deviation and also means are very sensitive to extreme values. One, ext like one small extreme value in the data can like drastically increase the standard deviation and it can drastically shift the mean. And as it increases standard deviation, you can also cause other points that would traditionally be considered anomalous to not be considered anomalous because then you like deflate their z-score. And so to get more into like the quick mathematical theory about this, why does this happen? So what is the mean? So it turns out the mean, if you're giving a set of numbers, you want the mean as sort of like a summary statistic, as some number that describes the set. And arithmetically, the mean is actually a number that solves this optimization problem. You can basically think of your set of numbers as a vector in some data space, uh, in, some, in a vector as a vector space. And the mean is basically a vector, uh, some number s, that sort of minimizes the distance of the vector in like the L2 norm. So this may be complicated. It may be too much math for 9 a.m. It's 10 a.m., not 9 a.m. So but the key thing you need to get out of this is that there's this like xi minus s squared. That's quadratic. And that basically means when you have extreme value, it's going to like increase quadratically. And I'm going to show this in the next slide. On the other hand, the median it solves that me, uh, minimization problem, which is optimization in the L1, L1 norm, and is pretty robust to L1. And show like what's the issue with the mean, uh, mean of standard deviation. So in these um, two plots, what I did was I created an array of, it's an, it's an array with 99 values of 10, and then one value uh, that's an extreme value. So that can be uh, the extreme value is 10 to the number at the bottom, so it'll be 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. And you can see how like, the mean drastically as you increase the value of that extreme value. And as you notice, it takes sort of like a quadratic shape. It's slow quadratic, but it's sort of like an exponential, it's sort of like a huge spike. And so that's showing like, the mean is like, super susceptible to the one extreme value. All I've done added is one extreme value, and it causes the mean to shift greatly. Same thing with standard deviation. Once the extreme value, and the standard deviation just shoots up really quickly. So how can we get around this? Well, I mentioned it before on the last slide. The median is pretty robust to uh, outliers. So can we use the median to come up with a new way to do, define the center and the spread? And yes, we can. And so this is called the median absolute deviation. And so this is actually sort of like a more robust um, is more robust version, it's like the more robust cousin of the standard deviation. And how it works is it basically, it's sort of the median of the median deviation. So you pick up the data, you calculate the median, you subtract each, uh, the median from each one, and then you find the median of that. And so it's like the median, median deviation, whereas the standard deviation is sort of like the mean of the deviation from the mean. And so this provides a more robust measure of spread because it doesn't get affected by that huge outlier. The deviation from that outlier is not going to be the median, so we don't really care about that. It doesn't affect our median absolute deviation. And this is a pretty easy thing to code up. So this is what it looks like in Python. It's just three lines. You calculate the median, and you take the median of the median deviations. And then you do like a new version of z-scores. And so this is called the modified z-score. And so using the median and the median absolute deviation, we can compute the modified z-score for each data point. You take in your data x, and you subtract out the median. Uh, that's what that x tilde is. Divide by the uh, median absolute deviation. So that's your notion of spread, where like, normally that's where the standard deviation would be. And you multiply by this like, constant uh, 745. That's just more of a constant to make things work out mathematically when you do the integration. Uh, that's just more for mathematical theory. You don't need really need any more details about why that happens. And then you can use the modified z-score in place of the z-score to do like threshold-based testing. And so 
when you use modified z-score, it's recommended about the same levels of like 3.75. If a modified z-score exceeds, then you have an anomaly. And so this is nice because it's a quick and dirty method to doing real-time detection. Like you only need to keep track of two things, the median and the median absolute deviation, and you can quickly compute these modified z-scores for each incoming data point and then output normal anomalous on the fly. So now let's talk about density-based anomaly detection. Density-based anomaly detection, we basically have a bunch of data points in some n-dimensional space. And we know, want to know like, which one is noticeably different from the others. Uh, that's essentially the goal of density-based anomaly detection. If you look at this plot, you can kind of see which one is going to be the anomaly, right? It's that guy up in the uh, like top rightish corner. And so quick primer about density. So if you look a lot in like statistical methods and like some machine learning methods, you're going to hear this idea of like density-based methods, like DB scan, which is a clustering algorithm, is a density-based clustering algorithm. And so what do they mean by density? So the statistical theory behind this is that in like we assume that all the data is generated according to some probability distribution. We assume it's generated according to a nor normal distribution. We assume it's according to a normal distribution. And all those probability distributions have some probability density function. That's like the likelihood of a particular value appearing. And so that's what we mean by like prob uh, density-based clustering. We sort of want to infer what is the true probability density function that's in, uh, generating this data. We don't know what the true probability uh, density function is. No one knows what it is. It is any higher power, if any, that you believe in. But we're trying to estimate the, the probability density function. And so how we estimate density is going to be like a little trick of heuristically how we're going to think about it. It's like think back to your elementary science classes. What did you learn density as? Density was mass over volume. And so that's sort of like the little heuristic we're going to go uh, use as we go in. Mass, mass is going to refer to the number of data points, and volume is going to be like the volume of the space we're going to be looking at. And so the way we do this with local outlier factor is we're sort of going to like try to quantify. So this is an algorithm called local outlier factor. It was invented in 2001. Um, it's a very famous density-based anomaly detection algorithm, and there have been a lot of like variations of spin off of this. And so the question behind this is that like, the anomalies should be more isolated compared to the normal points. Like that red point up there, it's more isolated and, like, from all the other points. And the idea is if we quantify the relative density around that point, it should be much less than the, density, the relative density of every other point. And so the goal of like, local outlier factor is it was, we're going to want to estimate the density about a point, all, how many points are around it. And so to do this, we're going to need this first um, like intermediate value, which is the k distance. So for each data point, we want to compute the distance to its kth nearest neighbor, where k is specified beforehand. So k could be 3, k could be 5, k could be 100. And so this idea is that this k distance is going to give us our notion of density is like mass over volume. This k distance is going to give us an idea of volume. Uh, if you see the outlier, so that's applying its uh, k distance to its fifth nearest neighbor. And so it has like a large fifth neighbor, nearest neighbor neighborhood. On the other hand, that little point in the center uh, has the purple one and it has like a little like magenta neighborhood. That's a normal point. And it has a very small okay, uh, fifth distance, uh, case distance, close to the other points. And so the thing is that like the more isolated a point is, the larger its k distance is going to be. Since it's farther away from all the points, we have to look farther from it to find uh, other neighbors. And now, here's an interesting idea. So this is called the reachability distance. This is going to be getting a little confusing at first. And so the reachability distance A and B is the, uh, is the maximum of the k distance of B and the distance between A and B. And so this is sort of like a non-symmetric distance function, but it's going to give us some idea of like how your neighbors think of you. Um, so this is an interesting idea. So if you can imagine your nearest neighbors as sort of like your friends, the general idea of the reachability distance is do the people you consider to be your closest friend consider you to be one of their closest friends? So data point, then yeah, your, near, your nearest neighbors are probably also, your, your closest friends are also, probably also consider you a close friend. On the other hand, if you're the anomaly, 
then you can go up to your closest friends and like, hey, you're my friend, right? And they'll be like, um, yeah, sorry. And to sort of like prove this, uh, can the camera see me up here? Uh, so if you, so this is this uh, anomalous points neighborhood. And these are his clip, uh, five closest neighbors, these teal points right here. So let's expand the neighborhood this one, this point. So this is one of his neighbors. If you look at it, the anomalous point is not in its neighborhood. So this teal point doesn't consider him to be one of his close friends, but he considers him to be one of his close friends. And so like, that's why uh, the reachability distance is going to give us some like, your neighbors see you. So if your neighbors see you as one of their neighbors, you're good. If your neighbors don't see you as one of their neighbors, you have a problem. And now, like I said, this is all the years we want to estimate density. So we have this idea of volume. We have this idea of mass, because we specified how many neighbors we have to look for. If we specified k is 5, then we know the mass is 5, because we have a volume of, that contains 5 data points. And now we can sort of And so for each point, we're going to calculate the local density about it by taking the average reachability distance of its neighbors to a and taking the inverse of that. So we were wondering why we do this inverse. Well, the average reachability distance is sort of like the volume. And you take the average, you're dividing by the number of points, which is like the mass. So now we have like volume over mass. And we need to kind of get that into density. How do we do that? We can take the inverse. And so that's why the local reachability density is this like one over the average reachability dens uh, distance of the neighbors. Is that confusing to anyone? Or? OK. And now we have the, the average lo uh, local density for each point. And now we can calculate this local outlier factor score for each data point. And so the local outlier factor score is basically the rate your neighbor's density compared to you. And so the idea is that like, if you're an outlier, you come from less er uh, dense areas. So this ratio should be higher for outliers. So the average density of this point is probably something like very low. Yet if you take these five neighbors and take their density, it's going to be much higher. So this ratio is going to be a large value divided by a small value, which is going to be extremely low. And so the idea of the LOF score is like the higher it is, the more likely you're an outlier. And so for this example, uh, that outlier up there, the red point, has an LOF score of 2.7. What does that mean? Well, first of all, a normal point should have an LOF score between 1 and 1.5. What, what does 1 mean? It means the average density of your neighbors is about you're in the same, like, neighborhood, the same density region as your neighbors. On the other hand, if you, it's much higher, that means you come from a less dense region. So it should be, um, you should be, so you come from a less dense region, so the value is much higher. And so let's say if a point has an LOF score of three, that means the average density of that point's neighbors is about three times larger than its local density, which means it comes from a like, dense region. It comes from a region that's like one third as dense. And that's like kind of strange, because like the points near to you are nothing like you at all. And so that's sort of like our definition of anomaly. Like it's nothing like its neighbors. OK, and so next and final section is sort of like uh, time series based anomaly detectors. So the time series anomaly detection, we sort of have some index by time. Can we identify the ex extreme spikes and troughs in the time series? And one thing we need to keep in mind is we want to identify both the global anomalies and local anomalies. So global anomalies are ones that, like, in the entirety of the time series, these sort of stand out. Whereas local anomalies are more just, like, if within the specific, like, short time range between that point, it sort of stands out. And so this Twitter engineering blog, and it shows, like, global anomalies are these huge spikes up there, whereas, like, the local anomalies are sort of normal compared to the, the global thing, but within their, like, specific time section, they sort of sort of stand out. And so this algorithm is called the seasonal hybrid ESD, or the seasonal hybrid extreme student eyes deviate. And so this algorithm was invented at Twitter in last year, or it was released it last year. And so this algorithm has two components. It has a seasonal decomposition component, which deals with sort of like the time series element of the problem, and then deals with, has the ESD uh, component, the extreme student eyes deviate, which deals with the anomaly detection component of the problem. And so the general idea is that we sort of want to like remove some of the temporal noise from the data before we try to detect outliers from it. And so the first seasonal composition will sort of remove the temporal noise that we don't care about. 
And then after we remove the noise, so we basically clean the data, we can move it on to the second component, which will then actually identify the anomalies within like the remaining meat of the data. So the seasonal decomposition. So this uh, time series decomposition is sort of like a pretty classic method in like econometrics. Um, and so they get down the time series into like the three important parts. You break it down to the trend, which is like the actual thing you care about in the time series. You break it down to a seasonal, which are just like periodic patterns. So these could be like seasonal patterns. Let's say um, if you're in economics, you use those that like people's like uh, consumption of like electronic goods goes up during the winter because people are buying Christmas presents. So this is like a seasonal thing that happens every winter. You don't really care about that. And then there's like a finally like a random a residual component, which is that, like just your error in the time series. This is just like, a catch-all for things that don't fit in the other two. And like I said, the, the trend component is like really the thing we care about. We care about like, the trend because it's sort of like the important stuff in the time series. And so what seasonal comp decomposition does is we sort of remove, we take the time series, we break it down to these three parts, and then we remove the seasonal. We basically remove this periodic noise. If we're like monitoring users' behavior over time, and we notice that like, people don't do anything on Fridays, uh, and we don't really care about that. That's not specific to a user. That's like, specific to everyone. People don't do much on Fridays because Fridays they kick back and relax. And so we sort of want to remove that because we don't really care about that. And so after we, uh, so this is an example of the time series. So the above is the uh, observed time series, and then that, below that are the three components. So the, if you look at the above time series, it's sort of like it has this increasing uh, over time. And so the trend is just like the straight line that's increasing over time. You notice like there's periodic fluctuations in observed data, and that's the seasonal. It's capturing that periodic uh, uh, spikes and troughs. And then you have this random one, which is capturing the random noise and the fluctuations that can't be captured by the other. And so now we have taken the time series and we removed the seasonal uh, component, so we remove that temporal noise from it. Now how we find the uh, an anomalies. So the idea of the ex extreme studentized deviate is sort of like a statistical procedure to iteratively test for anomalies. We basically specify beforehand how many anomalies we think there are. We say, I think there are 10 anomalies in this data set, or I think there are 50, and then we sort of iteratively test for them. And one thing we have to be careful about is when you do multiple t uh, testing, is you run the risk of false positives. This is like a very important issue in statistics of like multiple hypothesis testing leads to like false positives. It's a huge problem in psychology where they'll run multiple tests run like seven tests at a time, and it's like, oh, one of these tests returned positive, you therefore, we found a meaningful result. Uh, XP uh, web comic has a comic about this, about jelly beans causing cancer or something like that. And so the extreme student devi uh, studentized deviate does is it allows you to do this like uh, iterative testing while compensating for the fact that you're gonna do multiple hypothesis testing. And so like all statistical tests, you basically have to specify the alpha value that you want to test for. So this is like alpha equals 0.05, you're testing at the five significance level, and you need to specify how many anomalies you're looking for maximum. And the procedures of how this algorithm works is for each data point, you compute the g-score, which is basically the absolute value of the z-score. You take the data point, subtract the mean, divide by a standard deviation, and take the absolute value of that. And so then you take the point with the highest g-score, and using your alpha value that you specify, you can compute this critical value or this critical threshold. If the g-score of your test point is greater than the critical value, you flag that point as anomalous. And now regardless if you flag it as anomalous or not, you remove it from the data set. And you just repeat steps one through five for the number of like, anomalies you're looking for. So if you're looking for 10 anomalies maximum, you do this 10 times. And so what this does is like, oh, find the most extreme point, test it and see if it's anomalous compared to what you statistically expect. If it is, flag it and remove it. If it's not, just remove it. And so now you have the re remaining data and you find the next extreme point. Uh, test it. If it's anomalous, remove it. If it's not, still remove it. And keep doing that until you're done. And so how this algorithm works, the result of this algorithm. So here's um, an example from Twitter. Basically, they have this time series, a seasonal hybrid ESD algorithm on it with alpha equals 0.05, and they can show like a, a couple of anomalies at the end. And so you see like the anomalies correspond to like these global spikes where it's like really high, or these global troughs where it's like really really low from more than what you expect. Like it's very noticeable. You can like look at that picture and say, yeah, that's kind of anomalous. It's like really high or really low. 
we do this stuff in practice? So one good thing I've learned while doing this is if you're giving this to an end user, if you're designing a system for an end user, you want to provide them with risk scores. So you don't want to treat this as like a classification problem if you know machine learning. You want to treat this as a regression problem. Because it's like very hard to say if something is like truly ano uh, anomalous or not. Like saying that something's a yes or no, this is zero percent anomalous. That's like a kind of a big judgment to make. And so rather you want to give a risk score between like zero and a hundred. So this way you say, like, yeah, I think this is a pretty risky uh, not, uh, value. Like, I'm going to give this a risk score of 50, or I'm going to give this a risk score of 70. And I recommend doing it from like a 0 to 100 scale, because people sort of like intuitively understand that scale. Like, 100 is bad, 0 is good. And how do you get these risk scores? Well, one thing you do is when you're calculating the uh, anomalous events, is you can sort of like assign a probability to it. You can say, like, given your critical values, given your LOF score, I can say, this corresponds to a probability of being anom likelihood of this is anomalous given this uh, critical value, given this LOF score, is like 75 or 0.75. Multiply that by 100, it has a risk score of 100. And you can also do um, additional calculations afterward. But you want to give them risk scores. People understand risk scores. They don't really understand probability. And finally, how do you test these algorithms? So one key thing is when you're testing your algorithms, you have to do it in completely different environments. Don't just test it locally within your company. You want to test it within your company. You want to test it in at a beta customer. You need environments. You want a small company, a small environment with like maybe 50 users or something like that. Or you want a huge environment with like thousands of users, hundreds of users. So that way you can see how well it does it across different environments. And so this is like huge because like in machine learning, you usually do like the training, the cross-validation, and then you do one set of testing. You have some testing data set that you run it on one time. And so that doesn't really work for anomaly detection. You need to test it at multiple different environments. In addition, I also recommend, since anomalies are pretty rare, create some synthetic data where you know there are anomalies in it. And if you can find the anomalies in those, OK, that's good. If you can't identify the anomalies in your synthetic data, then you have a problem. Because if you can't even find the anomalies you know you're there, how can you find the anomalies that you don't know are there? And one thing is that you, over time, consistently be testing these uh, algorithms and fine-tuning them. And so one thing I recommend is building a test harness to like automate testing of your algorithm. So as soon as you make some changes to it, you can easily test it and see how well it performs compared to previous iterations. And I recommend sort of like building your own test harness so you sort of know what you're looking for and what you're testing for compared to like some off-the-shelf test harness. And so yeah, that's my talk. So I guess at this time I'm done. So if there are any questions, I can take those now. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so why do you have to specify the number of anomalies? Um, that's because, like, theoretically, you could easily go through the entire, like, um, a test for all the data points anomalously, but like then you have this issue of like you're doing the multiple comparison too many times. Like if you test for enough times, you're gonna flag a bunch of uh, false points, um, get a bunch of false flags, because like the way the critical value works is sort of like decreasing over time. Like, okay, you test the first um, point with some high critical value, you remove it, then you sort of lower your critical value, so you're sort of like gently relaxing, and you do it in too many times, or if you do it for the entire data set you're basically going to find too many false flags because your critical value will get too low. Yeah. OK, so I guess uh, how well do you scale? So actually, the, the first one, the uh, modified z-score stuff and median absolute variation, this scales pretty well, because a lot of this can be parallelized pretty easily. Like, you just need to calculate the median globally, and then you can do this, uh, calculate the deviations. Um, if you have some distributed system like Spark or Hadoop, distribute that across the uh, nodes, calculate the deviations for each one, bring it back together, calculate the median absolute deviation on like, the global system. And so this actually works very well. It like, scales very well to large data sets because it's like a quick and dirty method. It's supposed to be quick and it's supposed to scale easily without doing like too many complex comp computations. 
So next is the local outlier factor. How well does this scale? So this actually, if you implement this correctly, I think it was like doing this k-distance stuff, uh, scaling that well. So in SciPy, there's an um, algorithm called the KD tree, which is like, it sort of does nearest neighbors really well. It's like implemented really well. Uh, SciPy KD tree. Um, it's in the spatial library. And so that will do the k distance really well. And so as a result, this algorithm, if you use that or some like efficient implementation of a KD tree or whatever program language you use, you can scale well to the number of data points you have. Uh, the big issue with LOF, it scales poorly with the dimension of your data. So if you can go for like 10 dimensions, it works okay. If you have like a 10,000 dimensional data points, then it doesn't scale so well because you have to calculate distance in 10 dimen uh, 10,000 dimensional scale, uh, space. And then you run into this issue of like the curse of dimensionality. So it scales well like with the number of data points. It scales pretty poorly with the number. Um, there is an algorithm that deals uh, better when you have like high dimensional data. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Um, yeah, but it, it, it does exist. Uh, people have thought about this, and that's one of like the variations of this. And then finally, there is the seasonal hybrid ESD. This actually scales very well with the amount of data points. I mean, it was in, invented by Twitter, so it has to like scale to the amount of, you know people vomiting into the void that pe that people do on Twitter every day. So it has to scale well to like that level of data. And so this is, it actually scales pretty well to like a large amount of data. Uh, time series is usually like one uh, time versus one value, so it's not you don't have to run into this like dimensionality problem. Yeah. So this is like that's like the million dollar question. Like, how do you pick the K? And like any sort of these like clustering algorithms, like K means how do you pick K? Like that's the million dollar question. Um, best thing is to try out different values, see what you get. Because like, oh hey, maybe this would look no like this would look anomalous. Maybe that point would look so anomalous if I had like two data points right here. So like just a trio, three, trio of points, and like maybe I said K was two. Then this point would look look too anomalous at all. Do you want to like try different values? Also taking the fact that the higher the K is, the like slower this algorithm will be. Um, so as a rule of thumb, I generally use like um, lo if n there are n data points, I use log n as value and then work from there. Uh, what do you mean mixture of distributions? Well, like Uh, so, uh, so uh, what you're thinking of is more of like using k means to find like little clusters, anomalous clusters. No, I'm just saying, how do you make sure that you, you know, how do you tell the difference between that case where it's not really anomalous because it's different? Yeah, it's two. Uh, uh, two, like two different. Oh, so there are two da different like data, gener data generating processes. Uh, how do you do that? Yeah, so that's actually a uh, kind of they really can't handle. Like this LOF assumes that like all the data is generated from like the same distribution. Yeah, um, there. Are, I'm sure there's some other algorithm that help, happens like a mixture of Gaussians. I'm just not sure what they are. Um, so I'd imagine to be similar to like um, how you do feature selection and other supervised learning. Um, just because of the company I work for, I really don't have to do much feature selection because like the uh, company has like proprietary security software and that data gives us like maybe four to five features for each user and so I don't have to do any feature selection on that. I can just use all the features they give me. So I don't have like really any experience in this um, but I imagine it would be too different from like how you do uh, feature selection in any other traditional machine learning problem. more questions? Okay, I'm done.